This idea of human selfishness is also then kind of based on a notion of like instrumentality. That human beings do stuff for instrumental purposes. Actions within the basic structure can have a profound effect on the distributive upshot of our societal organization. Happy New Year, everybody! Welcome to Owls at Dawn. We are just two dudes from Southern California who studied philosophy, politics, and religion around the world and decided to start a podcast where we could bullshit with impunity. I'm Austin Hayden-Smith. And I'm Troy Polidori. And for our first episode of 2019, we are going to be jumping back into our parliamentary book club. What did we call it? Our It's the Parliamentary Book Club, yeah. That's it. But there was a longer name for it, wasn't there? Was there? I don't remember. I, parliamentary Book Club is perfect. And for people who are wondering, why Parliament? We're not fucking British, are we? No. So uh, a group of owls is apparently called a Parliament. Troy randomly found this out. So, yeah, a Parliament of Owls. A Parliament of Owls. So this is our Parliamentary Book Club where we're going through G.A. Cohen's book based on his famous lecture series, If You're an Egalitarian, How Come You're So Rich? Today we are going to jump into chapters 8 and 9. You might be asking, why 8 and 9? What happened to chapter 7? We'll tell you when we get into the main segment, because it's kind of a cool little story. Um, Also, uh, reminder for people who find value in this podcast, if you can go to patreon.com slash owls at dawn and become a patron and help uh, help support us, $5 a month will get you access to bonus episodes, the monthly newsletter, as well as being involved in the Democracy Motherfuckers option to suggest episodes for a future topic. Two bucks a month gives you option for the latter of those, just the Democracy Motherfucker one, Um, which also is something we should mention, that we are going to be starting our poll for the next patron-led episode. The last one we did was on the ethics of suicide, and it turned into like a fucking three-part series, which was awesome. <laughs> uh, this one, I don't know if we'll do that, but you f- never know. Um, Troy, do you want to announce what the three uh, are, or the four? How many are we doing? F- how many episode options are we releasing in the poll? Is it four? It, it was three or four or five. Okay. So <laughs> we're going to do... Yeah. <laughs> okay. So we're going to do... Uh, Everyday philosophy, uh, psychoanalysis, like the relevance. The relevance of psychoanalysis, yeah. Of psychoanalysis. Uh, doing philosophy with children, like should we teach it in schools and shit? Or just and philosophy then, education in general. Okay. And then the fourth one was the role of like, or the relationship between art and the artist, or like the philosopher and the philosopher. What was it exactly? Yeah, I think just kind of generally, I think the recommendation was... Um, Sort of, what do you do with artists who have, you know, sort of objectionable personal morality or actions in their history, but their art is um, something commendable? But I mean, we can just talk about generally the idea of separating the individual from their work, separating the sin from the sinner. Troy, I mean, who wants to do that though? Love the <laughs> sin and the sinner. I love the sin and the sinner. Yeah. So uh, those are going to be the four that we're going to put up in the Patreon poll. By the time this episode is out, which is going to be like a, a day or two after we record, it will be live on Patreon. So if you're listening to this and you are a patron, go over and make sure to vote in the poll and select one of those four. If you're not a patron and you want to get involved, go to patreon.com slash owls at dawn and you can find out how to get access to the Democracy Motherfuckers tier. Additionally, uh, if you want to write us a review on iTunes, um, as long as it's a five-star review, you can ask any sort of question and we will... As long as the question is not uh, like incredibly personal or you know intrusive, we'll answer the question. It has to be something that we can answer in like, you know a couple of minutes, and maybe we'll turn it into a longer thing. But it has to at least be the kind of question you could answer relatively quickly. Um, and pretty much, it's open season on that, so you can ask whatever you want, be it funny, uh, inquisitive, or whatever. So leave us a review on iTunes or on Spotify, and we'll have that figured out uh, f- fairly soon. As long as it's five stars, we will answer the question that you write in your review. Sweet. Yeah, and I just wanted to say real quick, too, there were like a shitload of amazing recommendations from the, the patrons out there about episodes. I mean, there were so many that we could have chosen from. We obviously had to narrow it down to just a few that we felt like we could handle. Um, 
immediately. A lot of them are, would have required, you know, a little bit more research or something like that to delve into, which I'm totally down with. Um, and then a couple of them are going to be addressed with future guests. So there was a question about Venezuela. There was a question about poetry. Those are ones that actually we're going to be addressing in future episodes uh, that are already planned. We're going to have some guests that are going to come on that are a little bit better versed than Troy and myself on those topics. So if you're listening and you're like, what the fuck, man? Why don't you give poetry or Venezuela or some of the other ones um, uh, a hearing? We might uh, in the main episodes anyway, um, just they might be a little bit outside of our wheelhouse. So just so you know, but love it. Keep fucking suggesting sick things like that because they're challenging and you never know. We might want to be able to tackle them from a, a more sort of broad philosophical angle anyway. So that was great. So thank you for that. Yeah, love we it. were glad to have all those recommendations um, from so many diverse topics too. It was pretty cool to see. It wasn't just a talk about ethics or talk about philosophy of mind or whatever. It was some really diverse stuff that was um, really interesting to see. And hopefully we'll get to a lot of these things in the future. Yeah. But onto the main episode. The first thing we do, as always, is the shitty minute. This is the segment where one of us rants and raves about whatever it is that's grinding our gears at the moment. So, Austin, what's got you all in a tizzy? Yeah, so I got to be careful with how I word this because this is going to be one that could, could be really easily misconstrued. But I want to just briefly rant a little bit about the concept of privilege as an epithet that is automatically disqualifying. And I want to be clear that I'm not saying that I don't think that privilege is uh, a term that has any sort of categorical purchase. I think it does. Within certain contexts, defined in a particular way, um, that articulates a certain type of, let's say, constellation of meanings. However, it has become just this common disqualifying uh, designator that you can just throw around at anybody to somehow just say that, well, their argument is invalid. Their position is invalid because it's a privileged argument, right? Like it's become, it's become an adjective to just completely negate something. Well, that's just a privileged argument or that's just privileged. You're just privileged. And it's not even just the you're just privileged that I'm so much concerned with, even though I do think that it is kind of, that it has some issues as well that could be explored. But it's that it's this adjective that's now described towards an argument, that the argument is privileged. And the thing is, is regardless, I mean, we could get into a debate on how far we take logical fallacies, but it just seems to reek so much of a genetic fallacy to me, right? And I think so many times people are using this argument simply because it's something that they don't like because it somehow seems to be intellectual. And if it's an intellectual argument, that somehow, therefore, it's ivory tower, it belongs in the seminar room, and therefore, it's a privileged argument because it's some sort of bourgeois rationality. And I think that there's, that we really need to be careful when we use that because, I don't know, it, it doesn't really seem to be a very clear delineator of what is actually inherently problematic with the argument that is being categorized as privileged. It's just simply used as a sort of vulgar term and... I don't know. It, it just it seems to really stifle thought rather than try to productively engage with the apparent contradiction or paradox that's being proposed. And I think that's fucking bullshit, man. And so this really started to like come to my attention. I was recently on Rev Left Radio with Brett and uh, in Twitter afterwards, we got amazing feedback on the on the episode, but one person did say that they loved the conversation except for when the quote private school Marxist started talking about anarchism, <laughs> which first of all is going to be my future band name just for <laughs> ever, the private school Marxists, a hundred percent. Um, but Brett was like private school Marxists. Are you talking about me? And I was like, I'm pretty sure it was directed towards me. Cause I mentioned the private evangelical school that we went to. Um, and I did go to a private elementary school, uh, for a little bit in Orange County once my mom moved us from L.A. But one of the things I started thinking about, I was like, so interestingly enough, this person discredited me. I mean, they were being a little bit cheeky because we actually had like a really nice back and forth after that. But they were being serious in a criticism. And the thing that I thought was so interesting, I was like, so I'm being, I'm being discredited because apparently I went to private school and that was like my first real introduction, like in my formative intellectual years to Marx, right? But the strange thing is they're kind of also subtly indicting my mom who was a single mom who uh, didn't have the same sort of, let's say, privileged background that I was afforded. But because she was able to kind of like 
relatively climbed the social ladder in such a way and then moved out of the ghetto of L.A. down into Orange County and worked multiple jobs so that I could go to a private school, I was a little bit kind of like, so in a way then you're kind of like discrediting what my mom did to make sure that her little boy had opportunities that she didn't have, you know, whose father died on her lap when she was 12 years old and whose mother was paranoid schizophrenic and was homeless her entire life. Um, and so my mom was on her own at 12 years old. So like, but then what my mom did is she wanted to guarantee that her little boy didn't have that. So as a single mother, she ensured that that was the case. And then she put me in private school because she wanted me to have a good education that she didn't have. And so I was kind of like, so there's this like invalidating uh, approach when you wield that term. And I was kind of like, I don't know. There's something strange about that, 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 that I understand working class struggle and I want to side with working class struggle and, and, I'm, I'm working through kind of like how to define the proletariat now, and I've been reading a lot of Hart and Negri, and I know they get a lot of shit for kind of trying to think through a different formation of the working class. But I do think that there needs to be a different sort of understanding of proletarianization, uh, especially in the age of like late capitalism, um, that isn't just reducible to people who are, have like surplus labor extracted uh, in the same way that, you know, 19th century Marxist formulations had. Um, so, so I'm kind of like working through that and trying to figure out like how to still be sensible or sensitive, let's say, to the needs of like genuine like uh, working class under like typical capitalist formulations, and then maybe expand that out and broaden that out to to different categories, similar to what Cohen does in uh, one of the previous chapters uh, that we did. I think it was chapter six. Um, yeah, go ahead, Troy. Yeah, you know what this sounds like, Austin. Hmm. You know, I just I can't even fathom how privileged you'd have to be to whine about privilege. What meta privilege you must have in your private school Marxist education to spend this time learning about privilege? Hmm. That was supposed to be a joke. <laughs> yeah, I know. No, 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 no. I know. Yeah, it, it's know. so stupid, right? I mean, we've talked about hypocrisy critiques a lot on the podcast, right? And just how they're they don't tell you anything substantive about the argument or the idea being discussed. And even more importantly, you you said this already, but I want to reinforce it. It's a conversation stopper. Like, look at it from a speech act theory perspective. What it's right. doing is trying to stop conversation, trying to stop discussion, which on certain occasions maybe is okay if the you know discussion is like violent or harmful or whatever. But the vast majority of the time, it's just someone's way to like to get someone else to be angry or to piss off somebody else or to feel like they owned somebody, which is all right. just childish and stupid. Well, and it's anti-dialectical. And I mean that literally. The point of the dialectic, of dialectical reason, is to find an aporia, identify a contradiction, a paradox, and you productively work through that because you recognize, as Bertel Ullman makes clear, that there is an internal relation between these supposedly discrete units, right? And it's exploring the internal co-constitutive relation between these elements that we find to be in a paradoxical differential relation and figuring out how it is that we can work through that paradox. And that's what the dialectical approach must be unwaveringly committed to if you are going to be somehow in the Marxian tradition. Now, if you don't want to, if you don't want to kind of like perpetuate that and you want to kind of think uh, within a different framework, that's fine. You know, some sort of positivist rationality or something like that. But if you're going to be committed to the Marxian orientation, then there is a sort of commitment to the dialectic. And to try to just simply stifle any sort of conversation because it somehow is something that you find, you know, threatening or repugnant or something like that isn't necessarily the immediate orientation that ought to kind of like define a Marxist critique of political economy or culture or whatever, which kind of all flow and circle around a similar like matrix, right? So, I don't know, I just found it very strange. And then I also, I've been wondering through this, I don't really know how to think about it. How do we think about somebody like my mother, who is very working class, um, and maybe not even like traditionally in the sense that she like worked in a factory or anything like that, but just she comes from an impoverished background, comes from a very poor family in New Orleans. And then, like I said, she had her own immediate family life where she was on her own at 12 years old. And then she works... In such a way, and yeah, granted, maybe she had certain privileges as being like a beautiful white woman, you know, um, even though people think she's Mexican because she's super, super fucking tan. Um, but it's just like the French and she's got like a, she's got, she's got like an Elizabeth Warren amount of Native American in her, Troy. <laughs> Um, but no, she's got like that dark French skin. And so uh, she looks kind of dark and she's got dark features. Um, 
but still, she's she's a white woman and she's beautiful. So yeah, maybe that afforded her. And she's super charming and personable and sociable. So maybe those things helped her. Yeah, I mean, those are things that she's been able to parlay into uh, helping her climb the social ladder, so to speak. But she did that in such a way to make sure that her little boy didn't have the same hardship she had. So then do we look at people like their offspring now and it's like, well, fuck you guys because you guys are just privileged motherfuckers. And now part of me is saying this as somebody who got offended a little bit, right? And so I'm trying to work through my own like reasons for offense. And am I, am I just trying to justify it or am I, I'm trying to understand this. And then I'm trying to look at, so then does my mom, is she like less of a person because she's an idiot because she's a class betrayer because she raised a bourgeois or pet, petit bourgeois child? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the very fact that this is now the discussion point, right? How do I justify all these things that I didn't really have any say in? And even if I did... I don't think necessarily are in any way wrong or bad. You shouldn't have to even be thinking about that when you were trying to discuss some academic or intellectual topic, right? Like that, that was not germane at all to the discussion. You can think about right. those things separately, right? And this overall, all very interesting, right? But that's more about how you sort of think about yourself and um, sort of self conceptualize. That had nothing to do with what, how other people address your arguments, right? That's just, it's such a weird way of looking at, at the world. Um, and it's very uninteresting, you know, because it just ends up sort of in this like navel gazing, solipsistic thing where we're just thinking about ourselves and how to figure out what we are. Um, mm. Which, if anything, that's got to be like the most anti Marxist thing, right? It's all about the individual and the individual bona fides. Mm. Um, that sh- really shouldn't be at all relevant to the discussion at hand. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, from my work, we'd call it a, I call it a form of serial reason, um, which is actually derived from a sort of mystifying form of alienated logic that is like appropriated and then kind of projected onto the world outside of it. And it becomes a sort of like narcissistic, um, static, limited and limiting paradigm of thought. Um, but yeah, it, it's something that I, I, I see. It's so common. I think 2018 was like the year of online. I don't know, declaring everybody to have a, a privileged argument and then just automatically like disqualifying it. It seemed to be like one of the the common or one of like the, you know how they do at the end of the year, like the terms that are the most popular in a year. I would not be surprised if the rate of usage of the word privileged in online engagement spiked in 2018. Yeah, that seemed to have been a major theme. But that that all said... I'm definitely calling you a private school Marxist next time I'm pissed off at you. I mean, I'm going to use that <laughs> moniker. I f- fuck it, man. Like, whatever. <laughs> You're all about that uh, reappropriation thing? Yeah, private school Marxists and champagne socialists. Or as our <laughs> friend Michael calls himself, he's the champagne of beers socialist because he drinks Miller High Life. <laughs> <laughs> For our main segment today, we're moving on with part four, I believe, of uh, G.A. Cohen's If You're an Egalitarian, How Come You're So Rich? And we'll be addressing chapters eight and nine in this episode. But first, we should say something quickly about chapter seven, since we didn't cover that in the previous episode and not covering it here. Um, Austin, you seem to have had a, a pretty visceral reaction to this chapter. You want to describe that? When I first read it, a few weeks ago, because, you know, I skipped ahead a little bit after we finished chapter six, and I'm reading along with us. I have, I'm have i not reading ahead, right? And when I read chapter seven, I was like, that is fucking amazing. Um, it's basically, the title of the chapter is Ways That Bad Things Can Be Good, A Lighter Look at the Problem of Evil. And I'll just read you the entire chapter, because it'll take 30 seconds, maybe less. Lecture 7 could not be reproduced here. That is because it was a multimedia exercise. The audience accepted my invitation to sing with me to the accompaniment of tapes, a set of American popular songs that illustrate how bad things can be good. Persons familiar with baseball will know about the seventh inning stretch when the crowd is asked to rise and sing Take Me Out to the Ball Game, usually to the strains of a loud organ. Ten lectures are, I considered, more demanding than nine baseball innings, partly because they are ten, but mainly because they are lectures. So I thought my audience would like, would, like baseball fans, appreciate a moment of respite. But the respite that I laid, uh, that I laid on cannot, alas, or otherwise be embodied in mere print. Chapter end. And 
I just thought that was fucking amazing because I love... So I don't know if you have Googled or watched a lot of YouTube videos of G.A. Cohen. For people who are listening, please just go to YouTube and type in G.A. Cohen. He does like these weird theatrical... (laughs) They're amazing. (laughs) ...conversations with like Russian Karl Marx. Yes, Karl Marx with a Russian accent. And they address why he has a Russian accent. But like alive then, which I think must have been in like the 80s or 90s or something like that. And he's on film doing an interview where he's playing both himself and this Russian Karl Marx. And then he does this one where he's doing like this German accent. And he's actually being recorded by Eric Owen Wright. And he's talking about like what German freedom is. And they're kind of like laughing and you know what it reminds me of? It reminds me of like when you're with your homies and <laughs> you're you're like stoned and like one guy is the theatrical guy and he starts doing like some sort of impression or something like that. And then someone has a phone and, you know, it, it goes on like Instagram nowadays or something like that. But this is done in fucking, you know, the 90s or yeah, like late 90s, early 2000s. And it's just a bunch of like academic dudes. So he's kind of... He's just got like this fun personality. So then I'm reading this, chapter seven, and I can totally see who he is now, or at least a little bit of a better glimpse of who he is now. He he isn't just this stuffy, like, academic, I'm at Oxford or wherever the fuck he was. Was it Cambridge or Oxford? Oxford. Oxford. Um, and uh, and he's just like this stuffy academic wearing patches and smoking a pipe and drinking sherry and talking about like, you know, the navel gazing issues of like philosophical discourse or something like that. No, he's also just like a dude that is kind of funny and kind of cute and sweet at the same time. And I loved it. Yeah. And I want to reiterate to watch those videos. I mean, there's some, have you seen the one on (laughs) Thomas Jefferson? No, I didn't see that one. I saw, I saw the link, but I haven't clicked it yet. I will. Oh my God. It's, I mean, I don't want to spell too much, but it's basically Thomas Jefferson. It's J.A. Cohen imitating Thomas Jefferson writing the declaration of independence while berating one of his slaves. And it's just the irony in it is so beautiful. Um, he's really good at those. I almost wish these are apparently a pretty famous series of clips that he made that his students and other people knew about. And um, there's probably a lot more of them that are even on YouTube that uh, people in the know or who were students might have access to. But uh, they're fantastic. Definitely go and watch. They're only a few minutes each, so it's not a time suck or anything. Mm. Yeah. I mean, and as somebody who grew up in and around the theater and is still involved periodically in that world, I love the art of performance. So, (laughs) you know, this idea of doing this multimedia thing where people get up and sing, like he says bad pop songs. So I'm thinking at the time, this is right around the turn of the century. So 99, I mean, what, what, what are you listening to at that point? What are bad pop songs? I mean, he could be listening to like 80s songs, 80s, 90s pop songs. Um, fucking Rick Astley or something like that and everyone <laughs> stands up and they're singing Never Gonna Give You Up together and it's a bad song but the joy that is mimetically spread right that there's like this this affective contagion that is spread that produces joy in people's lives as you're standing together it's like a sort of without uh, the metaphysical baggage that comes along with it it's sort of like a, the sensationalism of the church ceremony the idea of the worship service is like bringing people together and sharing a joyful expression and there's a reason why song and eating and dance has historically, throughout all of human history, been something that has bound people together. And I think that there's something just so fascinating about that. It doesn't have to be Shakespeare that is being recited in order for it to be a good thing. It can be, you know, something kind of shitty. You know, it can be just watching The Good Place. I'm not that it's shitty, but it's just something, it's not appealing to the higher pleasures, as Mill might say. You know, it's the simple lower pleasures that can be great. And uh, and I think there's something fantastic about that. Yeah, I mean, I, I tried to find something about this presentation from Chapter 7, but I couldn't find anything about it. If anybody out there does know of any recording or accounts of um, this lecture, definitely get in touch with us because... We would love to see that. Absolutely, man. Oh, fuck. I hope there's a video of it. (laughs) Okay, so then chapter eight, the title of it is Justice, Incentives, and Selfishness. So, Troy, do you want to give a little overview of what's going on here? Yeah, so Justice, Incentives, and Selfishness. Uh, Cohen's uh, main point here is to talk about um, inequality and selfishness and the relation thereof between the two. Um, And he begins talking about or mentioning the fact that there's in sort of political philosophy of the day, um, since we're getting into this idea of talking about normative 
political philosophy um, that he started to argue um, in the previous chapters is necessary to move away from sort of old school traditional Marxism. Um, there is occasionally a defense of inequality, uh, more than occasionally, a defense of inequality, um, given the status quo is one of inequality and inegalitarianism. And he says that the two, there's sort of two modes that these defenses of inequality come from. Uh, or come in. And they are the normative mode and the factual mode. So the normative mode would be that it is right or acceptable that there's some level of inequality to, between people in society. And the factual mode would be that whether or not it's right, inequality is inevitable between people in society. Mm-hmm. Um, and he wants to sort of talk about how traditional Marxism views this notion that inequality is... A- is actually good, or maybe it's actually inevitable, especially the latter. Um, and he has a bit of a difference between the old school Marxist conception um, and his own. Actually, more of like a point of agreement and a point of uh, sort of dissension between that. Did you see that as well? Yeah, well, because he kind of been basically, he's basically saying that the the factual defense of inequality. It, it kind of is traced to an essential understanding of the human as being selfish. Right. And so undergirding this, there's a theory of humanity. There's a theory of the human that is essential, and it's based on human selfishness. And um, I think there's something really important to understand here, that this idea of human selfishness is also then kind of based on a notion of like instrumentality, that human beings do stuff for instrumental purposes. You do stuff in order to get something. But but what you're doing in order to get something is all about sort of like satisfying your own selfish desires. So there's like an instrumentality and a selfishness that is essentialized in this factual defense of inequality that, that needs to be understood. Right, and he says that um, he obviously disagrees just like the old Marxist view does with the idea that human nature is static and unchanging in that way, that it's just inherently selfish and that's it. And I think I mean, pretty much everybody who's like take, taken a sociology class <laughs> doesn't think that that really kind of naive uh, notion of selfishness is true. It's more like, I mean, you can say this because you've, you've read a lot more of these economic textbooks than I have, but the kind of traditional behavioral economics explanations are more like, Selfishness is just kind of the, the the like working hypothesis we use because it's the least complicated, and because we don't <laughs> yeah, have time basically. to talk about behavioral psychology for you know thirty chapters before we start talking about economics. Is that correct? You think? Yeah, I think within a certain strain. I mean, there are people uh, that have tried to look at how it is that like bounded rationality and uh, and things like that. But for the most part, let's say in, in bourgeois economic theory we might use, if we're going to use a proper Marxian term, let's say uh, the neoclassical marginalist school of, of political economy in particular, they tend to view, it's almost like that it's the first impulse, you know? Like if there's like a first nature and a second nature maybe of humanity, the first nature is like this biological selfish impulse that is kind of just presumed. But then they're like, but then of course, you know, we can like, change that and people can be nudged like that's a big there was a book that was called what was I think it was called nudge a couple of years ago that it's all about like you know how you can nudge people's behavioral orientation or whatever to what it is that they consume and what they desire and whatnot um, but nevertheless it's all built on this sort of prior principle or this prior understanding of human nature as somehow being selfish and I hear this all the time when I talk with people when they're like well do you really think that if you tax rich people too much then they're going to be incentivized to invest their money which again, it's all being appealing to this idea of how do you understand human incentive? How do you understand human nature? And the, the presumption is from pro-market types is that people are only going to want to invest money into productive capital if they are uh, incentivized in their selfish human core. That somehow they're going to get a, a, a valid return some sort of valuable return on their investment. And so that's what we need to do is we need to, you know, uh, this is the old invisible hand sort of parable of the bees stuff is you need to kind of uh, appeal to the vices, um, even though it, 
he actually talks about that. I think Cohen actually mentions that um, at one in one of these here. Maybe it's this first one. You need to kind of appeal to people's vices so that you can stimulate that vice towards selfishness, but then at the same time realize that benefits are going to kind of consequentially issue therefrom. And I think you know, intended or not. Yeah. Yeah, and one of the biggest issues I have with and Cohen talks a lot about this at some point, although in a bit of a different vein, is even sort of traditional um, capitalism itself doesn't can't be viewed that way because the entire thing depends upon the social structure in the family and the family is like got to be one of the least selfish institutions that exist uh is there mm-hmm. still moments of selfishness within the family right i mean you want your kids to be just like you a lot of times or uh whatever right um but mm-hmm. definitely there's self-sacrifice involved in being part of the family as well as any social grouping and the family is just the necessary one. Um, so capitalism couldn't exist without this like nuclear family or at least it didn't historically, I guess it could have in like a counterfactual, you know, possible world, but, <laughs> um, it, it, it would have been totally different without the family. So, and that's, you, you just, you, you're not like born 18 years old with an education with proper nutrition and your full grown body and no sicknesses and then enter the marketplace. Like <laughs> if that were the case, then sure. We could talk about all this individual, uh, human capital and selfishness and all this stuff, but that's just not at all a picture of the real world. Hmm. Yeah. We kind of talked about that on our episode with the guys from left out, uh, which I, I think I attributed to Graber and it was where David Graber says something along the lines of, you know, we live to be capitalists so that we can go home and be communists. You know, yeah, all the things we care about in life are, involving social groupings that are outside of the market. Like the market fucking sucks. Right. Unless you're one of those sociopaths who just only cares about that. But look, everyone looks at those people and thinks they're sociopaths, right? Like there's something wrong with their brain that they're obsessed with purely market-driven forces. Right. Yeah. You don't get too many people that are like, I want my kid to grow up to be like Gordon Gecko. You know? <laughs> who do you what do you want your kid to be? A predatory lender. That's what I want my kid to be. <laughs> So do you want to talk about, okay, so the, so the selfishness defense of inequality, Cohen says, has two premises. First, there's a human nature premise, which is the one we talked about, that people are by nature selfish. And then second is the sociological premise. And it's that if people are selfish, whether by nature or otherwise, then equality is impossible to achieve and or sustain. And the interesting thing is he says he used to reject both of these premises, but now he's become more sympathetic to the sociological one. Um... And so, and again, let me just repeat, the sociological one is so that if people are selfish, then equality is impossible to achieve and or to to sustain. And this is where he kind of goes into an interesting sort of, let's say, maybe like a materialist analysis. And the argument that he ultimately presents is that, okay, let's say that people are selfish. It's not because of human nature. He kind of disregards that, right? He, he, he says that that seems to be uh, oversimplified, overgeneralized. And it doesn't really match with the facts of what we understand uh, about historical anthropology uh, or, or the, the facts that we've derived, let's say, from historical anthropology, from our experience, anecdotal experience, our experience in the family. That just doesn't seem to make sense. However, there might be a sort of like uh, a way that we can say that selfishness does obtain in human culture, but it's because of capitalism, right? It's Or it's because of the social structures that have induced a sort of selfish orientation. It's the symptom, not the cause. Right, 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 right. So then he says, okay, so then if that is the case, that people are selfish under those conditions, then equality is impossible to achieve and or sustain. Under those conditions is the argument, right? Right, so the sort of traditional Marxist answer to that, as Cohen describes it, is that, well, no, I mean, individuals are only selfish because of the structure that sort of incentivizes selfishness and trains them to be selfish. And so if you change the structure, then you'll change their desires, right? Change uh, the base material conditions, and then the people will be different. And Cohen says he's less sympathetic now than he th- with that conception or that answer um, to th- this, that part of the selfishness um, argument than he used to be. I thought that was mm. pretty interesting because I wasn't quite expecting that but then the way he just the way he explained it i think makes a little bit more sense um what he's trying to say with disagreeing with the kind of traditional marxist um argument against that is just that um it's not the case or it could be the case we should say that's 
um, if human beings were sort of um, naturally, eternally, you know, unchangeably selfish, then inequality would be necessary. He seems he says he's more sympathetic with that, um, mm. and I think what he's trying to get to is this idea that you actually have to change the selfishness. Um, and people are, people have to change in some respect individually in order for society to be different. You can't just have this, he thinks, naive notion that if you change the structure, you change the people as if people are just nodes, um, on a, you know, large map and you change the map, you change the nodes. Um, mm. he, th- he seems to be pointing at some idea where it has to be a both and. It has to be like a, like a parallax view, right? Where, mm. Um, or maybe even like more dialectical view where the individual changes the social and the social changes the individual. And you have to have both arrows, both causal arrows at the same time to have the proper Mm. effect. Mm. Yeah. I mean, and I, I really like this argument. Uh, I agree actually like a hundred percent. Maybe it's because I've just been so influenced by the work of Sartre and then people who have engaged with debates around similar concerns. So I'm really interested with the idea of subjectivity. Um, granted, we must say that like even people like Lenin were concerned with the idea of transforming people. You know, this, this notion of recognizing selfishness or how capitalism affects our, our rational and behavioral activities has been something that has consumed, you know, socialist theorists, political theorists for centuries. But there's there's a particular strain that kind of uh, currently kind of comes out of the post-phenomenological landscape that you find in the work of like Slavoj Žižek, uh, Alain Badiou, obviously Jean-Paul Sartre, and then you find it in like the post-humanist and like psychoanalytic thinkers like Kristeva and Luce Irigare and Lacan and post-Lacanian thinkers, and more recently today like Alenka Zupancic and uh, thinkers like Gilles Deleuze and Michel Foucault who are like anti-humanists or post-humanists or however the fuck you want to describe them, but they're kind of like contesting the notion of the human as being a sort of static autonomous concept that ought to be withheld, and they're sort of like trying to unpack how it is that there were previous notions of the human that overdetermined sort of political philosophical orientations and they want to kind of like think outside that, kind of like circumvent that path that had been carved. Um, And so for me, I'm very fascinated with this issue of how do we understand this complex swirling debate between structure and subjectivity or between, let's say, the human or Lom or... Uh, bodies and the material world? Or how do we understand thought and consciousness and rationality and matter? And these these binaries that are often set up, um, how do we complicate, how do we problematize those binaries so that we can sort of like unpack them and realize that, well, they aren't just these discrete separate spheres, but there is something more of, like you just said a minute ago, a dialectical or what I would want to call a co-constitutive relationship between the two. Now, even though Cohen doesn't frame it in that way, in the way that I just did, he's hinting at something similar because what he says is he says, this Nostrum says that for inequality to be overcome, there needs to be a revolution in feeling or motivation as opposed to just an economic structure. That's a quote. Now, the idea of feeling might be, I'd want to know what does he mean by feeling. I don't think he means just simply like sentimentality, like the good feels. But I think he means something more at like the uh, embodied affective level. Yeah, I think and just subjectivity in general. That's why he gives it so vague. I think that's what he means. Yeah, yeah. So he's not just saying like sentiment. Yeah, and you know what? I think you're right to, to point out all this like post-humanist and um, phenomenological stuff. I was actually thinking a lot more on the lines of just the, the kind of current political uh, scene today and all the discussion and good discussion, I think, about things like post-work societies, um, the universal income, and stuff like that. And all those things I'm very interested in and I think are, are often good ideas, or at least in part good ideas, but then I also think that there's this strain of thinking that if we just change the material conditions of society to be better, which I'm all for, 
then the rest of our problems get resolved in sequence, right? Mm. And that just seems to me incredibly wrong. Um, not to say that therefore we shouldn't change the material conditions, but that there's so much more that has to be done and worked through alongside and after that happens, if it were to happen. So you like, you think about, for instance, what happens if all of a sudden the guillotines came out tomorrow and Mm -hmm. we divide up all economic resources and material resources equally amongst people? Um, are things better tomorrow than they are today? I I would think no. (laughs) I would think they're a lot worse. But the hope would be that they could get better than they are before. Um, and so that, that's really vague, but I do have this notion that we are kind of built or sort of trained under capitalism. And that means like emotionally and effectively trained as well. And a radical change in that structure without a radical change in sort of our more effective and, and, and subjective dimensions would be like terrible for us. It would it would result mm. in lots and lots of unhappiness and depression and chaos and people who don't want who really don't want to do anything at all all day and just fall apart. Um, there's a lot more work that would have to be done than to just change the structural conditions of society uh, to make our world better. And that involves talking about these issues. And you know, Cohen calls this the Christian social nostrum, which I'm interested to see how that comes out, um, why he calls it Christian as opposed to like religious or, or otherwise. But, um, there's something there that needs to be talked about and needs to be kind of excavated because it's not a thing people like to talk about very much, especially in the left. Mm. I want to take this even one step further. And this is actually something I talk about in my book, uh, that will be coming out this year, uh, in a couple months, um, Mm -hmm. that I would even say, that unless there is also simultaneously a transformation of subjectivity, even the very proposals for the transformation of structure are going to be contaminated by the same serial or let's say capitalist or neoliberal logic that conditions them in the first place. Which means that if we are so constituted, then that means that even the sort of effects of our constitution, the effects of our rationality, the effects of our praxis, whether it's in thought or in action, are going to be conditioned by that serial logic that is conditioning us, which means that our proposals are going to be contaminated to some degree. Now, Mm -hmm. some of them are going to be more contaminated than others to a greater degree or to a lesser degree, but the point is is that that serial rationality, that logic of capital that is constituting our bodies in the first place is going to also contaminate the effects of our thought and our praxis. So there has to be a way to dissolve. There has to be a way to perpetually dissolve the stranglehold, let's say, of these mystifying, counter-revolutionary, anti-dialectical forms of conditionality. And so you have to have a level of subjective transformation that accompanies the transformation of the structure and vice versa. And I would, I would, I would actually argue that they do. If you transform subjectivity, you are going to transform structure and vice versa. But the question is, is how, to what extent, under what conditions, and then how can you maximize, for lack of a better term, free expressions of human praxis, those that aren't conditioned by the stifling logic of capital that it is that Cohen and others are trying to contest. Yeah, they're both the individual and the social, the subjective and the structural, are necessary conditions, but they're both individually insufficient conditions. Right? So you have to have you have to have both at once. It's like the the classic turning both keys to to send the torpedo out, right? <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. I like okay. that. Okay, yeah. so then, so now he turns to Rawls at this point. Yeah. So should so, we talk a little bit yeah. about about background on Rawls, maybe for a minute? Yeah. So the main discussion point here, there's a lot to talk about with Rawls, but for Cohen is Rawls' difference principle, and there's sort of several parts to the difference principle, but. The that's main, most people concentrate on Rawls anyway, isn't it? That was like, that's like the thing. Like in his two principles, everyone's like, yeah, yeah, the first principle, liberal rights for people, whatever. It's the difference principle. <laughs> yeah, not a lot of discussion about whether or not people should have equal uh, access to public offices or equal liberties. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> right. The difference principle is the one they talk about the most. Mostly because yeah. it, it kind of gets at both the left and the right of Rawls, right? So you have many mm-hmm. different points of uh, contact with it. So 
the main, there's several parts to the difference principle itself, but the main point that Cohen's talking about is the defense of inequality. So Rawls's uh, point about inequality is that um, in a sort of basic structure, so in a set of institutions in society, he calls it the basic structure, um, that structure is just, it's fair, it's good, if and only if any inequalities that exist, exist in such a way that they maximize the benefit of the worst off. So the idea would be something like, um, if you had some arrangement between your friends or whatever, um, it's only fair if whatever inequalities exist between you and your friends make whoever's worst off in that group the best that they can have, right? So if you had some arrangement that where the outcome was like, uh, one person gets $10 and one person has $0. But then another possible arrangement is that one person um, has $9 and one person has $7. Then you would prefer the 9 and 7 to the 10 and 0, right? Um, because the worst off person goes from 0 to $7. But then what happens in the more tricky scenario when the greater inequality ends up, say, maximizing the total? So you could have an effect where someone has $50 and someone has $10, so the total is 60 And in some other situation, um, where there's sort of a fair distribution um, of maybe like 20 and 20, but the grand total is less. So like if you're a utilitarian, for instance, you might argue, well, then the, the grand total um, is what matters, and so you should have maximizing utility overall. Um, Rawls is going to say, in that point, he disagrees with the utilitarianism and says that the inequality is important and is only justified when it maximizes the benefit of the least well-off. Um, so he disagrees with utilitarianism there, um, but then also disagrees with you know a more Marxist um, spread the wealth around equality is important kind of an idea, because Rawls thinks that we in those kind of situations you end up having equality with lesser overall or kind of grand total gross benefits. And that it's possible in, say, a liberal capitalist framework to maximize the total and then just spread around um, the distribution in such a way that it maximizes the worst off while still having some level of inequality in order to get as a constituent condition of getting to that grand total, if that makes sense. Yeah, and then also, isn't it the case for Rawls that if there is that radical sort of Marxian notion of equality, you sort of disincentive you, you Incentive, disincentivize. I'm trying to figure out how to say you disincentivize people, right? And that there is actually a way to sort of justify the necessity of inequality because you incentivize people in order to climb the social ladder, so to speak, right? Yeah. One of the reasons he thinks that this is necessary is because you have to incentivize people um, to want to work the most or be productive in order to get to that grand total, that sort of gross overall benefits um, from which you then distribute. Right, 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 right. And so you need to reward those people for doing that work so they get a little bit extra, dense inequality. Right. Now, Cohen, Cohen, Cohen says something here, and I want to ask you if he isn't misrepresenting Rawls a little bit, because what he says is a little bit different. He says, Rawls says that inequality is justified when it has the effect that those who are worst off are better than they would be if the inequality were removed. Now, that's different than saying the worst off uh, are given maximal benefit under the conditions of the basic structure. Those are different, those are different nuances to uh, an exercise or a, an engagement with the notion of inequality. Are they not? Well, I mean, when he says they're better off than if the inequality didn't exist, I don't think he's saying just compare that inequality versus the same situation without the inequality or when there was a different distribution or something like that. So it was equal distribution. I don't think he was saying that. I think he was kind of just pointing at the Rawlsian idea of maximizing. I mean, because I, the, no, go ahead. It's called the maximin, the maximin principle or the maximum for the minimum for those who are at the yeah. lowest end. Right. Okay. So the reason that I, that my, my, my triggers went off with this was because I was thinking one way you could you could reformulate Cohen's way of saying this is that Rawls is saying that inequality is justified under capitalism, let's say, because the worst off are better than they would have been were they not under a capitalist system. 
So that's how you could justify it from this perspective. Capitalism is good because uh, inequality is better under capitalism than it was under feudalism. So if the if the basic structure of liberal capitalism were removed, they would be worse off, right? Is that that and that is kind of what Rawls is saying. I mean, yeah, somewhat, right? If you're just comparing, say, feudalism to capitalism, right? Or maybe like um, just really vulgar, brute Marxism to liberal capitalism. But, I mean, Rawls wasn't setting out to defend just the status quo, right? I mean, he was absolutely a critic of right. of capitalism, right? So he, he was a very strong proponent of the welfare state and whatnot and a much more just distribution of, of benefits to people. So... You could use that type of argument to just defend capitalism, you know, to a court and then against sort of Marxism as it's like political left enemy or whatever. Um, but I mean, I don't think Cohen's even representing Rawls that way. I think okay. he is representing Rawls as like the liberal democratic welfare state type that okay. says that inequality is not sort of the main point we should be focusing on sometimes inequality is justified. Okay, because I I wanted to make sure that he wasn't basically saying that Rawls is saying, hey, a little bit of capitalist exploitation is okay. So because, you know, at least it provides more resource access to the very needy than if it were the case that capitalist development never existed. Now, I do think that by extension we can say that yeah, that that is something that is there as a criticism of Rawls. But do you see what I mean? Yeah, for sure. That definitely is. I just don't think it's necessarily what Cohen's exactly going for. And we should also add, okay. I mean, this is you know tangential and a little inside baseball, but even Rawls at the end of his life became pretty disenchanted with a lot of um, this focus on defending inequality and became much more concerned with the fact that any inequality that exists ends up perpetuating the conditions for more inequality. Um, okay. And yeah. so he, which, he, he himself yeah. acknowledged a lot of this stuff later in his life. Which is where the kind of where the argument is nowadays, too, is recognizing that, that it doesn't actually incentivize people to climb, but actually you sort of like rigidify within your tiers, and that actually inequality only deepens inequality. It kind of like self-perpetuates rather than actually incentivizing people to close the gap. And, and so that's kind of where more of the, the, the discussion on inequality nowadays is focused because of uh, new findings since what Rawls wrote Theory of Justice in 71? Yeah, early 70s. Yeah, 72, yeah. So, something like that. Something like that, yeah. Okay. So, okay. So then Cohen goes on to say that, so Rawls claims that his argument is normative, but Cohen actually argues that it's factual. And that's the idea that uh, that Rawls tries to claim that it's a sort of like normative justification for equality. But Cohen actually argues that it ends up being factual. It ends up being a sort of like essentialized understanding of the way things are and that they must therefore be that way. So in other words, Cohen ultimately goes to show not only is it the case that inequality for Rawls is acceptable, but he actually then, Cohen accuses Rawls of kind of actually justifying the necessity of inequality, that it is, it is factual and it is necessary based on um, whether sociological or kind of human nature principles with regards to uh, inequality. Yeah, so his critique of the difference principle here is basically, it's kind of complicated, it took me a few readings to figure out exactly what he was getting at here. But he's kind of placing a bit of like a um, eliminationist uh, or disjunctivist argument here. He's saying either these talented people, the people who are the producers who in Rawls' system deserve uh, the fruits of inequality um, because they produce more and create this grand total of benefits that people can um, get distributed towards them. Either these talented people are not driven by the difference principle. So they're not like motivated by it. They're just motivated by their own selfish desires or desire to maximize their own personal benefit or whatever, right? Um, which means that they don't accept the principles of justice, which for all is a huge problem because the point is you're supposed to, people are supposed to in the society accept these principles of justice, right? Or they do accept them, in which case they don't need the fruits of this benefit of inequality to incentivize their greater productivity. And Cohen's trying to bring out this like motivation incentive territory um, that he was talking about earlier in the chapter into Rawls, since it's not really, it's sort of assumed in Rawls, right? That people will just 
be motivated by their selfishness and that's just something we can expect and um, we have to include that in our analysis without actually sort of digging into it any deeper than that. And Cohenson is an actual real problem here because um, either of those options is bad for Rawls. It goes against the idea of a just society. So basically, is he saying that either the talented are innately talented or they are necessarily motivated by the differential relation of inequality, which then justifies it? Well, justifies he, holding holding people down. Well, he's not talking at all about whether they're inherently or innately talented. He goes in this long screed about saying um, he knows that that whole idea is fraught with difficulties because what we mean by talent could just be what at that very moment happens to be, you know, have the most utility. And that could be like yeah, a really exactly. bad thing. It could be that you're really ruthless and an asshole and that helps you succeed. Um, so he says, I'm not going to get into that territory. I'm acknowledging that that's huge and fraught with difficulties, but that actually helps my argument because that's something Rawls kind of has to assume that I don't have to assume. Um, he actually wants to focus on this idea that what are the talented people, whether they are really not really talented or good, what are these people motivated by? If they're motivated by the principles of justice, then they don't need the incentive of the selfish incentive of getting higher wages for their greater productivity. But if they're mm. not driven by the principles of justice, if they don't care about having a just society, then they don't accept the principles of justice. And part of Rawls' whole system is uh, a system is just or a structure is just if the people can fairly accept without reasonable complaints the principles of justice. Um, so Cohen's trying to sort of present a problem or like a uh, an aporia here for for Rawls, mm. um, which is pretty easy to answer, and he acknowledges that there's a typical Rawlsian response to this, which is that Cohen's just misunderstanding what the structure of society is, right? Because the basic structure of society for Rawls are the institutions, right? It's things mm. like Congress and the laws and stuff like that. Those are the things that are either just or unjust. What he calls co co like coercive structures in because they're coercive, later. right? That's right. usually the reason why they are the basic structure. Well, what, what individuates the basic structure from not basic structure? Well, some yeah. things are coercive and some are not, right? So yeah, they tell you what to do and what not to do. Yeah, the police are part of the basic structure, so they can be just or unjust. Yeah, he's not talking about like normative behaviors like social pressure and things like that. It's it's the juridico political framework. When you when you go to the pub or you go to like the uh, the venue for a concert, and you're thinking about how to act and how to behave, right? Are you going to go up to somebody and say something kind of nasty because you've had too much to drink or you want to take them home at night or whatever, right? That's not an action. That's like an ethical action, right? Or an ethical action. But it's not like a just or unjust thing, right? Only social um, institutions can really be just or unjust. It's kind of the Rawlsian position. Right. And Cohen wants to problematize that and say – okay, I get your objection, right? That I'm talking about individuals and how they're motivated. And that's not how they're motivated for their personal sort of actions and their personal behavior. And that's not a that's not the subject of justice. That's like individual morality or whatever. And Cohen mm. wants to say, the only way you can do that, the only way you can separate the individual moral, uh, moral stuff from the social structure stuff is by saying the latter is coercive and the former is not. But that's totally false. Because in every way that the social structure stuff is coercive and it has profound impacts on people's behavior, so does right. the individual moral stuff. So if you right. disinclude the personal moral stuff from the basic structure, you have no non-arbitrary reason for doing that. Yeah, this is – so, you know, Cohen does want to justify the idea that the personal is political. And he kind of like talks a little bit about what he means by that phrase – you know, uh, he says that, uh, you know, obviously it's it's usually attributed to kind of uh, feminism, even though he says apparently that uh, Christian liberation theologians are the first ones to have really coined that, which I found really fucking fascinating because <laughs> I was sure like, I want to, <laughs> yeah, because it was, uh, he's, he quotes Denny's Turner and then I couldn't find the Denny's Turner article that he quotes where Turner makes that argument. And I was like, oh, fuck. Um, but the idea of the personal being political is the idea that, um, those non-coercive behaviors ought to be factored into notions of distributive justice uh, just as much as those coercive institutions. 
right? And that the norms and the behaviors. I mean, people who are familiar with Foucault, right? And the idea of, uh, of like the norms, like the, the, the normal and the abnormal, like a Foucauldian analysis would really focus on these non-coercive structures of power as being integral to an understanding of justice. Rawls is not as concerned with that. Cohen wants to shift Rawls in a different direction and say that Rawls is missing that idea uh, of the personal as being something that is political. The personal does have bearing on justice. We can't simply exist at the level of the politico-juridical or the juridical political, I mean, I'm sorry, um, in order to try to understand what justice is or how it is we understand um, societies of fairness. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure you had the same reaction. You mentioned Foucault. I just kept thinking, wow, I wonder if any continental philosophers in the audience all of a sudden like had their ears perk up. Yeah. Because this is this would be exactly, I would think, a, a sort of someone from the continental tradition who's talking about Foucault and Deleuze and stuff like that. They would probably want to bring this up about Rawls, right? Just just put it in analytic language. Yeah. I mean, I think it's important to – this is something I was really fascinated with is that Rawls's thought experiment, because that's really what it is in his theory of justice. It is – it operates at a high degree of abstraction, right? And it is a thought experiment that I think is meant to stimulate and motivate action and rationality – it's not really meant as a barometer by which a government would sit there and say, well, in what way are we, uh, are, are these two principles of justice obtaining? You know, is it, does everyone have ensured basic liberal rights and does everyone have equality of opportunity? And then now are we able to justify inequality based on the, this idea that the, the worst off are, uh, their well-being is maximized under the conditions of inequality within the basic structure uh, and in accordance with these two principles. Like, I can't imagine, like, fucking Congress people sitting around doing that. And I don't think it's intended <laughs> for that, you know? No, it's like, not, definitely. It, it's definitely a thought experiment. So then my question is, is I have no problem with engaging at the level of ab abstraction. As a matter of fact, I think that all thought is ultimately an abstraction from materiality. The question is, is how do we use abstraction? How do we employ abstraction? There's productive abstraction and then there's like violent abstraction. Rawls's formulation to me is extremely formal. It's extremely abstract in the violent sense, in the simplified sense, in that it operates by the doctrine of external, uh, external relations. There are these discrete units and they can be analyzed in their separate sort of external relation to one another. Whereas I'm always going to want to like complicate things by bringing them together into an, a, a relation of internality. They're internal relations. There's co-constitutive things. We can't talk about this supposed idea of equality of opportunity as being a discrete unit separate from liberal rights. And we can't talk about liberal rights and the insurance of liberal rights unless we understand what the human is. Like he's presuming a certain notion of the autonomous individual, I think. Um, or this notion that's like this 18th, 19th century uh, liberal understanding of the human that is something that, you know, like the Foucaults and the Deleuzeans and the posthumanists have like really wanted to kind of like explore and, and deconstruct, for lack of a better term. And so for me, there's so much oversimplification in this high degree of abstract formality in Rawls's formulation, Rawls's formulation that Cohen's argument for me was really appealing because it does tend towards, like you said, the concerns of a lot of kind of the continental philosophers uh, or the continental tradition. And so that's why I really vibe with what he was trying to do in, in problematizing Rawls's formulation. Yeah, and I think we should add also that – I mentioned this earlier, but when – you know, theory of justice comes out in the seventies, right? Rawls mentions and goes at great pains to describe the fact that he's making ideal theory as opposed to non-ideal theory, which is more on the ground and takes account of um, empirical observations and all that good stuff. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think, justified because before Rawls, it just wasn't really this way of doing political philosophy. And I think if you charitably interpret Rawls, he's kind of trying to do what Cohen was trying to do um, or trying to argue for this normative political philosophy, right? But of course, Cohen doing it after the end of Marxism, Rawls kind of doing it in the midst of, you know, democratic, political, liberal capitalism. Mm. Um, but they're kind of trying to do or a similar sort of thing. Um, and Rawls himself, I think, 
puts out this theory of justice, right? It changes the whole landscape of political philosophy. It, it basically creates analytic political philosophy, you know, as a major um, sort of discretionary or um, tool for analytic philosophy. And 30, 40, whatever years later, he writes justice is fairness, which is like the restatement of a theory of justice. And basically in no uncertain terms says a lot of empirical observations have been made in the intervening time and kind of distances himself from this idea that inequality is justified. Um, mm. You know, he does it from a more like scientific empirical observations type of setting, right? But I don't know that it matters the means as long as, you know, the end is, hey, we got to rethink this whole inequality thing because it's not the way we thought it was. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I think that there's tools from within Rawls. You can make these same sort of arguments. And um, Cohen's coming at it from a different perspective. Uh, I don't know if you wrote this before, Justice is Fairness, but um, I don't think Rawls is like all of a sudden like a, you know, socialist or anything, but he's certainly came a lot closer um, at the end of his life. Hmm. Interesting. So what do you think about this idea that, that the concern is that the basic structure of society is just and that that's where our concerns with justice ought to be uh, directed? Well, I loved Cohen's reply to that because his reply okay. is basically a um, reductio ad absurdum, right? He basically says, if you want to make this arbitrary distinction between the coercive state and the non-coercive, you know, non-state or whatever. Um, and that the, the coercive state is the only thing that can be just or unjust and everything else is like individual morality or whatever. It's not part of justice. If you do that, then he kind of creates this like um, counterfactual scenario of some Protestant commune or whatever it is. <laughs> um, and he says, you would have to, if you're taking this Rawlsian distinction um, to heart, Take an account of a society where people are uh, not motivated to make the worse off better, but then do so indirectly. Perhaps they develop this really great Protestant work ethic and um, create this abundance, and then they all share it with each other or whatever, right? Um, that's less just of a society than one where people are motivated to make the worse off better, but they fail to do so because they're unlucky or they're ignorant of how, you know, economic actually works or, you know, all the things that stop us from actually having good policy, even when we're motivated to do it in real mm. life. Right. And Rawls, and then Cohen just says, look, that's ridiculous. Right? right. Obviously the one with the better outcome is just, or is more just than the one with the lesser outcome. Right. And so right. this basically just brings to mind Cohen's focus on what's called, you mentioned it earlier, distributive justice. And it's the idea of the benefits and burdens in society are distributed in a certain way. And that way can be just or unjust. And Cohen wants the subject mm. of justice to be that and not mm. sort of the way you relate to the institutions in your society, um, which is Rawls's focus. And so he wants to point that out or argue for that position by saying that Rawls's position leads to this reductio, which no one should like rationally accept. Hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, for me, one of the things that is always swirling around these, these, these issues about like distributive justice, and this is one of the things that I find very um, limiting about a lot of debates today between, you know, more identity-based leftist discourses and the supposed, what are sometimes I think wrongly termed class reductionists, but I think that are actually, there is a restrictive, it's a class restrictivist uh, logic that's going on. It, it goes down to how do we understand what resources are, right? If we're going to inherit the 19th century Marxist analysis of resources, then it has to do with property power relations. That's what it is. It's proprietary power. It's a zero-sum game, and it's who has control over the means of production, Right? Um, but I don't know. I think since Marx, we have learned a lot from various theorists and from experience. And I think a lot of like feminist theorists and, uh, eco-feminists and eco-socialists have really shifted our conversation into different areas with thinking regard to, with regards to what resources are. And I don't think that we can simply say that resources ought to be understood in terms of, uh, the traditionally defined notions of productive 
resources or those that pertain to productive capitalism, but that rather we need to look also at the level of symbolic meaning and symbolic value, social capital, symbolic capital. And that's where feminists and eco-feminists and eco-socialists have shifted the conversation and where I think identity conversations are oftentimes concerned whether or not they articulated in that way is with regards precisely to that, that the issue of oppression for somebody who's identity focused is based on this idea that, uh, that womanhood or that blackness are valuable assets that are socially produced or that are at least socially relevant and that they aren't treated as such, that they aren't given the value that they, uh, or at least the return, let's say, on the investment for the value that they actually kind of impute into the system, but that are viewed as like peripheral values or as even non-values. But nevertheless, they're still contributing factors to the larger social makeup. And so I'm really interested in this idea of the personal as political, of distributive justice, and of moving away from these kind of what I would consider more abstract and vulgar formulations of justice or of uh, of resource allocation that Rawls kind of falls into, but then even like a lot of like Marxist discourse falls into. That's a good point, I think. You know, we were just talking about the parallax between the individual moral issues and the sort of social structure issues, morality and justice. That same parallax exists between identity and uh, the social structure, right? Because if you talk about identity, absence of any reference to material conditions, you just get this like blind, blasé, um, sort of solipsistic, individualistic stuff that doesn't, it's just like banner waving, right? It's like sports team uh, politics, (laughs) which is just, means nothing and has no effect for anyone at all. It's just, you know, it's just being a fan. Um, But you can also talk about, you know, class stuff restrictively, like you're saying, without any reference to identity. And you actually miss a lot of the effects that are had on people that are based on identity, the symbolic meaning aspects you're talking about, right? Mm -hmm. You just miss a lot of the actual real material conditions. You actually miss it by focusing on this restrictive account of materiality. Mm. Um, this gets back to our, our, the book we're going to write called materialism of ideas at some point, (laughs) uh, co-authored by us. Um, (laughs) so you have to have both of us at the same time, um, in order to kind of fully encapsulate this idea of materiality, I think. Mm. Um, so yeah, Cohen obviously didn't have like the, the context to talk about that issue that's been so relevant the past several years. Um, but I bet it'd be kind of a similar, um, similar conclusion he'd have. Mm, Yeah, I think so too. Yeah. I mean, for me, Cohen is opening up some very important pathways, but he stops right at the point where I am most concerned, (laughs) right? Yeah. He's very much in the analytic analytic philosophy, uh, guys of like, I'm going to bring up the important issue. Here's how I'm going to bring it up. (laughs) I think that's why a lot of I, I've engaged with a couple of people on Twitter, and uh, from what they've told me, that they were like told by professors, like, don't even bother reading Cohen and stuff like that, because they were in like sociology departments or something like that, that were like more, let's say, what we tend to consider as Marxist dialectical materialists, right? And so they kind of viewed Cohen as being this abstract thinker of high theory. And and I get it. I, I understand why that might not be sufficient. But I think that there's something really valuable, nevertheless, in, in his approach to these problematics and the way that he's formulating. And just the fact that he is such a clear thinker that even if he's clear but within maybe what I would consider restrictive limits, there's something super valuable about that practice. And, and of his charitable granting of Rawls's position – and nevertheless, still problematizing it, right? Like, he's like, I'm going to present a fair, and I'm going to grant Rawls so much, and I'm still going to show you why it's wrong. And I think and there's something kind of really powerful in that. Yeah, that's his, like, his, like, modus operandi, right? Is like, I'm going to present someone's argument so well you're convinced by it. And then when I show you what I think is wrong with it, you'll have no way to say that I misrepresented it or I gave a straw man or... Um, was not charitable. 
And it's you know it's a classic right. philosophical move. It's not unique to Cohen, obviously, right? But it's sort of his his go to move um, to argue from within someone else's position that the mm. they don't account for what they need to account for to make their position coherent. Mm. Okay, so the way that he concludes his argument in this chapter against Rawls is, like you said, with that idea that you could have a society that is accidentally but not constitutively just. And that is problematic for Rawls's position. Yeah, because you would have to say that the um, distributive outcomes don't matter. It's the sort of structure itself that causes the outcomes or constitutes in some way the outcomes that's just or unjust. And Cohen just wants to say that no one would accept that if you really came down to it. And I guess you could, like any reductio, just accept the reduction, right, to absurdity, accept the absurdity, embrace the absurdity. Mm. Um, and maybe people do that. I don't know in response to this, but I mean, I think I'm personally, at least at this very abstract level, uh, pretty down with rejecting the absurdity and saying, yeah, the, there's no way that's just the social, the sort of coercive political structures that are just or unjust. That's just an arbitrary distinction. Um, there are so many things about life that are involved with whether a society is just or unjust that are not part of the coercive state institutions. That just mm. seems obvious. And that's his focus really in chapter nine, right? On where the action is on the side of distributive justice is how do we understand that, that bifurcation that is set up by Rawls between the coercive and the non-coercive? And, and how then do we kind of like figure out what justice means if we reject that simple binary. Yeah, I really liked this chapter um, because it was very simple. It wasn't anywhere near a super complex argument or anything. Um, but his basic position is that you can look at things like his two examples are the family and the and sort of the market economy and saying that actions within the basic structure can have a profound effect on the distributive upshot of our societal organization, even when they're governed by these neutral, quote unquote, Rawlsian just rules, right? And so that Rawls notion of justice, therefore, ignores this whole dimension um, that's outside of the coercive state institutions. But why should we care so disproportionately about state coercion as opposed to everything else? Like what motivates us to only focus on that as being the subject of justice? And there just isn't really a good reason. Okay, so this goes to the heart of like my ultimate criticism against Rawls. Rawls has no understanding or at least has no engagement with systems theory, right? Like he just doesn't get the fact that like he, he seems to, I've mentioned it a couple of times, he operates at this level of like what is sometimes called like the philosophy of external relations, right? Or the doctrine of external relations. And it's this idea that there are like these discrete units that sort of operate that have these clean boundaries and borders that are drawn and that they only operate sort of as totalities with one another rather than recognizing that the actions in your family unit are not these discrete sort of behaviors that don't have any sort of bearing. I mean, constitutive bearing on those coercive laws as well. As a matter of fact, I would argue that the coercive laws are held up as well as effects, as as valid, legitimized effects based on activities that are also taking place in the family. And vice versa, that the family's non-coercive, quote unquote, non-coercive behavioral activities are constitutively related to the coercive legal frameworks. So contract theory, for example, does impinge upon a marriage relation. Vice versa, should you pass the salt and say thank you, does have some sort of constitutive relation to contract theory. Now, it might not at the surface level. It might seem to be a sort of tenuous relation. But I think when you really put these two sort of uh, disparate fields into a dialectical tension together, you can see the cross-resonance with one another. And you recognize that things are far more complicated than the way that Rawls proposes things. Because, I mean, I, I maybe I just am like, I just think that everything is related, but everything is fucking related, man. <laughs> right? No, I, like, I think you're, you're totally right, 100%. Um, I think, you know, Rawls, probably to be charitable, 
um, would say, yeah, I, you're probably right, but let's see where we can go with this. Right. Let's see <laughs> yeah, where we can I, go I if, we, if we draw these boundaries very, very restrictively and see what we can say about it. Now, you can argue about whether or not that's an actually like beneficial process. Um, I think there's, there's some degree in which it's beneficial as long as we keep in mind the whole time that we've drawn these boundaries arbitrarily and that we need to step back from them and be a, right. be, treat them more as an object at the end. Um, which a lot of people don't do because they get too involved in their own little, you know, theory circles or whatever. Um, but that right. happens in continental philosophy too. That's not unique to analytic philosophy. Um, but yeah, you don't think, have to. You don't have to. You don't have to spread your shade, motherfucker. Okay, <laughs> you can keep your shade in the analytic. No, you're right. You're right. But I think there's there's something beneficial about coming out in the beginning and saying, "Hey, I'm drawing these boundaries. Feel free to critique them at the mm. end if that was the problem." Um, mm. Now, sometimes people get all like high and mighty and they want to have a little dick measuring contest, and so they they won't do that, right? But I think there's some something that's that's good about doing that and then you know we can come at the end and say look those boundaries that were so restrictive we have to broaden them because it's absolutely true that the expectations that a woman has as far as taking care of the home and and children and stuff absolutely affect how much money she's going to make and the freedom she's going to have in society regardless of what the um like actual laws on the books say right that's just overwhelmingly obvious Right, you can't mm. look at it for five seconds without realizing that. Then that means we have a problem in our ideal theory, and we need to address it. Like that's that's good, and we're doing it right now. So I'm happy with that outcome. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is where I think these thought experiments are. They can be productive, uh, but it it requires a lot of work. And I think a lot of times the reason that people might be more resistant to engaging at this level is because it is difficult, and it does. It does force you to kind of like uncomfortably think through things that that you, that that take time and and patience to try to work through. And like I found these two chapters actually to be very difficult to engage with, especially like you said the last one. But they were very difficult for me because they were pitched at such a high degree of abstraction. Yeah, Rawls is definitely man. I fucking hate reading Rawls. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so at the end here. Um, he kind of transitions to what we're going to talk about in the final chapter of the book, which we'll get to next time, which is talking about blame. And so the question that mm. Cohen has, which I really love this question because it gets into the normative ethics territory that I'm, I'm into, is if we can say then that individual choices can be unjust or just, and not just state institutions, not just the basic structure as Rawls defines it, but individual choices, like being sexist right, towards a woman, could be a form of injustice. Um, even if it's in a just structure, so counterfactually, even if you lived in a purely just basic structure of social institutions, you could be unjust within them. Mm -hmm. Then who's to blame? Because you could say, well, if you're living in an unjust society like we do, like everyone does, you know, a non-ideal one, then it's the structure that's the fault, right? But given what Cohen's saying here, it seems like Hypothetically, you could be unjust in your individual actions within a just structure. So if that's the case, it seems like the individual is to blame there. They're the only person left to be blamed. Mm. And so do we go down that territory of like moralization here, right? Does Rawls have a notion of subjectivity here? I mean, I'm not a Rawls scholar, so I'm sure he's mentioned at some point, but it's definitely not what he's intending to talk about. Yeah, because for him, the just subject is the structure, um, and he says that, right? Yeah. Yeah. But, but, like, but, but what I wonder is, is, does he have a notion of like, like individual behavior within the just society? Does he somehow think that people and – because he talks a little bit about how he's not concerned with like generosity and meanness and those tip kind of the non-coercive um, elements of, of the society. But does he think that somehow people would become more that, – that their own – like subjective makeup would become more in line with the basic structure of society? I'm sure he does talk about that. I'm not sure. He does say, he does mention stuff about psychology and like, you know, when you go in the original position where you're behind the veil of ignorance, you do know basic facts about human psychology. So he does think some like okay. thing called human psychology, which we're all involved with um, that you could talk about and think about. And that's germane to, um, political justice, right? But I don't know if he has any account of whether or not or how that 
psychology changes in relation to changes in the basic structure. I'm not sure if he does. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. I mean, I, I don't think that he would focus too much on that. That didn't seem to be his concern. And if he's kind of presuming, especially with his first principle, at least at this point uh, in the 70s and maybe prior, if he's kind of presuming this idea of liberal rights, he has some sort of like essential understanding of what the human is, it seems like. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if there's something underlying that, although I'm sure he wouldn't say that exactly. Um, but I will say right. again, in Justice's Fairness, he does come out and basically say inequality has different effects on people than I previously thought. And mm. um, it's, it, it's sort of a, it has bad consequences in and of itself, just as inequality. Um, and therefore, we have to reconceptualize whether or not inequality can be a good thing if it maximizes the the worse off. But anyway, okay, yeah. Cohen's point is he's going to address this more in the next chapter, the final chapter of the of the book. There's two mistakes you can make in addressing this concept of blame and whether or not it can be applied to individuals. One mistake is to go down the full social conditioning route and say the entire concept of blame is totally misapplied. And anytime someone does anything bad, it's because of the social and material conditions that they exist in. Um, it, that's more of like, you know, excusiology type of thing mm. than anything else. Mm. Um, and no one, I don't think, really believes that. Although sometimes on occasions, we tend to bring that stuff up, usually in order to rationalize our own behavior or someone else's behavior we like. Um, and then there's the opposite end, which is the full individ individualization route, where the blame is solely on the person and there's no account whatsoever of the conditions from which they acted or um, anything else. And that's like the more kind of traditional Christian idea, right? You're fully accountable for your own actions and that's it. And both of those are mistakes, he thinks. For I think a lot of the same reasons that we've been talking about, that you have to conceive of both at the same time to have a full account, right? Mm. And so he calls them the four factors. Um, one being the coercive structure, right, that Ross has been talking about. Two being the other structures in society, right, religious, familial, um, whatever else may exist that are sort of quote unquote non coercive. The social ethos, which I'm very interested to see what else Cohen says about this, because he's been talking about social ethos a lot and it's very abstract and vague. Uh, but it's something about the sort of system of affect and feelings and motivations that we all have that influence each other in some important way. Um, mm. Kind of religious in a sense. And then the individual choices that we make. And he thinks we have to judge this last one um, in concert with the first three. You can't individually take out that last factor and judge it all by itself. Mm. So something about blameworthiness and probably the, you know, the opposite praiseworthiness is going to be bound up with analyzing all four of these points. Mm. Yeah. I'm, I'm really interested in this question too, because I, I have very unformed thoughts about the issue pertaining to culpability, complicity, blame, and then like debt and guilt relations. And I'm really curious to see how he further develops this because um, just immediately, I don't think that complicity, culpability, responsibility, blame uh, necessarily connect in such an easy way. Like just because you are culpable for something, I don't know that therefore you are blame worthy, right? And I think that those are two separate questions. But in uh, more punitive societies, they conflate them, right? And if you are complicit in something, you therefore also bear the blame for that, and you therefore ought to be punished uh, because of that. So it's like there's a, a, a streamline from complicity, participation, um, to responsibility, to blameworthiness, to therefore an enactment of justice, um, which is like a punishment. And I think that there's something inherently prob or there's something extremely problematic with that. And I yeah. feel like he's he's going to confound that a little bit. Yeah, that's the second mistake, right? It's the full individualization of blame, right? Uh, but at the same time, 
Um, the opposite move is to just blame the structure by itself, right? In that case, I can produce a reductio to that. Dick Cheney's an asshole. Um, and I fully blame him for a lot of terrible things that have happened to the world. Not him alone, right? Not him by himself, right? Mm -hmm. Certainly, there are other factors that influenced and had sort of motivational effects on what he did. But I guarantee you, if I was in Dick Cheney's place, I wouldn't have done that shit, mm. right? Or if someone better had been in place. So I can kind of produce this kind of factual reductio here um, to say that both of those um, kind of naive, simple accounts of blame, it's all the individual or it's all the structure, just don't give you a full account. So there has yeah. to be some problematic there um, mm -hmm. to resolve. He talks about this a little bit, and I was thinking about this a lot, especially with the issue of sexism being at the forefront of our cultural ethos at the moment, or our cultural kind of like tied at the moment. And I was thinking a lot about how people, you know, are, are looking back at people from like the 50s and 60s or 70s, you know, Dustin Hoffman, for example, and how people are saying, oh, he treated women poorly in like the 70s or some shit like that, right? And then other people are coming out and like, yeah, but that was like just the, the times were different, you know? And there's this... There's this, bullshit. <laughs> yeah, there's a problem that's set up there, right? And it's like, okay, so so how do we understand? And I think Cohen even talks about that, right? Like if like somebody treats a woman in a sexist manner, like if it's a husband in a thoroughly sexist society, something I, I don't remember the exact example, um, but it's it's trying to figure out how do we understand somebody's com complicity, and then at the same time recognize that they are blameworthy, and then how do we then understand what justice means? in relation to those complex problems of recognizing social conditioning, social pressures, um, psychological constitution. Um, and then how do we also recognize that we don't want to simply absolve somebody, right? So we don't want to go to the one side, uh, to the one extreme, and we don't want to go to the other extreme either. You know, we don't want to absolve people and be like, ah, it's fuck it. They were just, you know, structurally conditioned and that's all right. So they, they treat people like shit, but that's just because society treated those other people like shit too. So therefore, uh, slavery is justified because everybody was doing it. It's kind of like <laughs> the, the answer, right? But then at the same time, you don't simply say, but that person and that person's choices individually are uh, exist only in a vacuum. So how do we understand that difficult sort of like cross-contamination there? Yes, yeah, super simple, right? <laughs> <laughs> fuck, man. <laughs> I know. I know, but it, it's so fascinating to me. And I think right now, the way that I can, I can comfortably uh, articulate it is that I just think that, that a lot of this has to do with our theories of justice. And I think that, that uh, like theories of retributive justice are inherently insufficient because they can only operate by creating that streamline through there, uh, but through all those various different points, and then punish the individual. Right, and I yeah. think that that retributive justice is fundamentally insufficient, precisely because it cannot think through these complex issues. Right, and then Cohen's introducing the obstetric model of Marxism as sort of the opposite end, the polar opposite end of the full structuralization. Right. Yeah, it's um, it's almost an accelerationist criticism. He's basically saying that the obstetric model of Marxism is basically saying that we have to actually justify the historical atrocities and just allow them to play out historically. I hear people say this all the time on Twitter. They're like, oh, but we just have to allow history. You know, we, we can't make those decisions now. We have to let history do it. <laughs> what the fuck do you mean by history? Are, we, we can't, <laughs> like, are you that? turning it? Yo, who is history? Is this an agent? This isn't an agent. And then you can't just throw your hands up into the air and be like, well, we don't really know because it's this complex process that is outside of our agential control. And we have to just allow for history to unfold the elaboration of, of better rationality. No, no, that's bullshit too, man. All you're doing is like justifying injustice, which is precisely Marx's criticism against religion. One of his four criticisms is that you're justifying injustice. So all you're doing then is you're turning history into a justifying uh, transcendent figure of God that says, no, we'll just allow this sort of like mystical, historical agent, whatever the fuck it is and however it unfolds, to do its thing and um, all sovereignty be to that being. It's just a fucking weird Protestantism, man. Yeah, and it's not just leftists who use that sort of logic, right? centrists use that kind of logic when they talk about how you can't really have left ideas because time's not right, right? We need mm -hmm. to, uh, all those um, poor farmers in uh, Mississippi who care so much about supporting Saudi Arabia bombing Yemen, 
So mm-hmm. we can't vote against it. Um, it's just not at the right time. You get those red votes. And then also mm. conser- conservatives use it too. You were just talking about the whole Me Too stuff. And it's like, well, you know, maybe now today our cultural logic is changing and it's inappropriate to talk to women in a certain way. But in the 70s, it was free willing and no one gave a shit, right? It's like, no, the women gave a shit. <laughs> you just didn't care about what they thought, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, slavery, slavery was fine. No one was arguing against it. Uh, the slaves were when they were escaping constantly and then being beaten to a pulp and killed. Like they cared, but you just didn't give a shit about them, right? Mm. So – it's that's that same sort of logic, um, structuralization type logic, is used from all sorts of avenues when it comes to rash, you know, like rationalization. I can't help but think that it's just because people have bad metaphysics, bro. Yeah, dude. Do you not think so? Yeah, it's exactly what I think. We've talked. But about how this. do you? But you can't say that shit in, in like an economics department. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know because I've I've tried. <laughs> yeah, you would. <laughs> I'm trying right now, as a matter of fact. Oh, Jesus. I know. No, but I, I really do think that it comes down to that. You might say that that there's like a, an insufficient meta-ethical framework. Yeah? Yeah, in part. I mean, I think the bad metaphysics gets down to that that root of it, right? Right. Um, but yeah, the, the meta-ethical framework, I think, is sort of more like the solution. And I think that's kind of what Cohen is trying to get at here. Yes? Yeah. I think it's absolutely what he's trying to get. Well, I mean, I don't know that he's trying to build up the meta-ethical framework so much as hint at the idea that we need one. Mm. Yes. Yes, exactly. And that's where normativity comes in to supplement the obstetric model of Marxism. Even if we don't use a normative framework as provided by somebody like Rawls, who's like the most famous normative uh, theorist of justice at this time, and probably ever, in, uh, in, or not ever, but in, in recent uh, contemporary political philosophy, right? So he's saying the obstetric model of Marxism is ins- insufficient for all these various reasons. Uh, therefore, we need some sort of normative meta-ethical framework, but we can't use those meta-ethical frameworks of like the the kind of bourgeois welfare state kind of theorists that is our, our popular and most popularly articulated by Rawls. We need something else. Right, because we can't just talk about social structures within our meta-ethical framework. We have to talk about individual moral decisions and also, although he's not going to talk about this, I don't think, so much, um, the other structures in society that are not the political or coercive. So that would involve things like the family and schools and religious institutions and sports clubs and you know, you and your buds who hang out at the pub God, dude, you, it's so funny. First of all, he's, I have a feeling, because there's one chapter left, I have a feeling he's going to leave us right at the point where we're like, God damn it, can you write a part two, please? Um, <laughs> and then I can just hear people listening right now who are much, who are resistant to this type of, of theorizing, who, who want this sort of like brute, vulgar, materialist analysis that you're finding on so much of the Twitter sphere nowadays, right? Between like the class reductionist types, let's say. And like, I feel like they would be kicking and screaming at reading this book, you know? But if you're listening and you are more inclined towards that type of position, I, I think we should just be patient and really like work through it. And I know it's uncomfortable because I'm uncomfortable reading through this text, but it's a discomfort that has been very productive in my own thought process. And so I would just kind of hopefully, if I can encourage anything, just a little bit of patience with trying to think through what it is that he's offering with this this notion of uh, an ethos or a transformation of the subject. Um, yeah. Because I can yeah, just hear I, it, man. I can, I can feel the backlash. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, I don't, don't want to get into this too much, but I also think that people who have undergone conversion in their lifetime know more about this than maybe people who haven't mm. right so you know both of us have gone through conversion and deconversion and and you came through a conversion even more radical um for sure than most people mm. um and then we both went through radical deconversions and if you've been through that experience that profound traumatic um subjective experience where not only your beliefs change but your affect changes and your desires change and everything about you is radically you know, decomposed and then um, you know built back up again. Mm. You you have this visceral understanding of what this transformation of subjectivity looks like, 
and I'm not saying that that means I have privileged access to, you know, some epistemic territory that other people don't have. <laughs> but I would say that I do think everyone's gone through some version of this in their lifetime just by becoming an adult, right? Is a sort of subjective transformation. Fucking puberty, um, man. <laughs> yeah, it's a different kind. <laughs> um, so you can look back on that. And I think if you're honest, it's hard to be honest about this for a lot of people, I think, because they just, it's hard to say that my beliefs changed and my desires changed and the person that I am changed. Cause that means in some sense, either I was worse before or I'm worse now. And those are both mm. things that are hard to accept, but coming to an honest realization of that, it's not only very freeing because it sort of allows you to be honest about how your environment has affected who you are. But then it also enables you to be so much more sympathetic towards change in the future and change in other people. Um, mm. And I think that's just really healthy. Like that's just a really healthy perspective to have. And also probably constitutive of, you know, being charitable towards Cohen's argument here. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, cool. So um, in a couple of weeks here, we'll finish up the final chapter, right? Chapter 10? Yeah, yeah. And maybe we'll do a little bit of wrap up in the book too. Maybe as cool. a bonus episode. Maybe. I will say this real quick, dude. You know, so there's a, a we're probably going to do a book club on this one scholar in a couple of months or whatever it is that we end up doing. But Dan Barber uh, is somebody who we will uh, engage with. But he's someone that I've been very influenced by. His new project, you know what it's called that he's working on? It's like a, a multi-volume project. No, I haven't heard. It's called Against Conversion. Really? Yeah. Interesting. So he's a philosopher of religion, but he does a lot of work on like Deleuze and uh, the idea of like the secular versus the religion. But his new project is called Against Conversion. And I have only heard him talk about this in talks that I've listened to online. But I, so I, I only know like the broad outlines and I've read like his, um, like a little summary of his research. But I'm really curious to see what it is that he's arguing because I think he's going to be critical of certain, let's say, political philosophical notions that derive from a sort of Christian motif that has embedded within it this notion of conversion. And I'm really curious to see what he says about that because I am very partial to this idea of subjective constitution and I want to know, can you think that without conversion? And I wonder if that's what he's going to be be kind of like navigating between I, I don't know but just found this out recently so that sounds interesting yeah and I'm really excited to read that this first book too. Yeah. spoiler 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 all right sweet so now let's move to our final segment of the first episode of 2019 it's sticky leaves man this is where one of us gets to Explain what it is that's giving us meaning in a world that is potentially void of meaning. So, Troy, what's got you feeling all joyous? So, the semester uh, ended in middle of December for me, right? And then I had a bunch of Christmas stuff going on and I was really busy. Once that's all over, I usually like to, kind of, as a tradition, take like a week and just spend several hours a day playing a video game to kind of oh. decompress. Yes. Get my mind off of all the academic stuff and all the responsibilities and just kind of focus intently on one thing. Um, it's very really relaxing and chills you out. It kind of helps you get back and ready again for the, you know, upcoming year. Mm -hmm. So this time I played a game called Undertale. Have you ever heard of this? No. What system? It's an, it's an indie game. Um, I played it on the PlayStation 4, but it is originally a PC game. Okay. Um, it's an indie game, so it's made by just this one dude whose name is Toby Fox, not some major uh, you know, games company or whatever. Yeah. And it came out a couple of years ago, and I, I got it a long time ago and just had never played it because I never had time. But it was a wonderful transformative experience. This game, here's the, the basic context. You are a young boy or girl. It's gender uh, nonspecific. And you find yourself cast down into the underworld. And so the tale is going to be in the underworld. Okay. And you find yourself um, trying to get back to the world, to your world. 
um, and you find yourself facing a bunch of monsters and different problems and experiences and all these things that happen. And you have the choice of whether or not to fight the monsters or to solve all of your battles in a pacifist way, nonviolently. So in every okay. encounter, you have the choice about whether or not you want to fight or not fight. And sometimes it gets really hard to not fight. <laughs> um, <laughs> and even some occasions where, I don't want to spoil that, but where it's almost like you, you basically, you'll lose if you don't fight. Um, but the tale, it just seems kind of like, this is weird. So it's like Bandersnatch. Choose to, it's choose your own adventure, but it forces your hand. Well, it's an RPG, so it's the original choose your own adventure. Or not the original, uh, but the original video game version of you know, role-playing games. Yes. And this game, it's kind of like, it's really cute and funny, and there's lots of you know, hilarity and comedy. And there's like, you, some of the, your friends are like skeletons, and they make lots of puns with bones. Um, and so it's kind of like, oh, this is a really cute game. The graphics are really like old school retro kind of cute. And so you, if you've played games from like the, the 80s or whatever, early 90s, the 16-bit games and stuff, you'll enjoy that. Mm. The, then the ending of the game happened. And I don't want to spoil the ending because it's, it's really important to experience it. It, I was destroyed. It was the most beautiful and complex and philosophically challenging ending to a video game I've ever played, for sure. Like, not even close. It was the most adult thing I think I've ever come across in a video game. And this is a game that was full of, like, cute puppies and bones that make uh, <laughs> puns. Uh, kind of cast itself as being this kind of cutesy game. And then all of a sudden it was like, holy shit, this is super serious and deep. Um, and it has to do with the necessity of violence. And mm. in video games, but also in the world, ultimately, is what it's getting at. And your choice about whether or not to be violent has profound impacts in the game. That's not as simple as if you're a pacifist, you win, and if you're violent, you lose. Not even close. Mm. There is no winning and losing, really, at the end. Mm. So I would encourage anybody who wants to spend like eight hours, it's not a super long game or anything, on something really interesting and challenging and, and thought-provoking, get Undertale. It's like $10, I think, if you buy it online. Um, maybe I got it on sale, but it was like $10. Mm. It is... It's an experience you're not going to forget. Um, and even if you're not a pro at video games, you don't have to be a pro at video games. It's not super hard or anything. Um, definitely do it. And support independent games. That's a good thing, too. I've never even heard of this game before, I don't think. But I yes. feel like... Yeah. No, go ahead. No, but I feel like um, I've heard of similar premises before with some of these indie games. It's just not my world, man. I used to play video games, but I just do not pay attention to that shit anymore at all. And the video games that I played were always like the popular games. I wasn't like a PC gamer or anything, you know? Yeah, I'm the same way. I've only played like the big games. But I will say, you know, a lot of games, especially indie games, are kind of going on this trend of it's not about killing 5 million people, right? Um, like you're in GoldenEye or whatever. Right. Um, but this game is different in that it's not just not violent, but like non-violent. Yeah. It's extremely violent, but it makes mm. you take account of your violence. It makes you think mm. about your violence. There's actually effects mm. to it rather than just, you know, hey, some like, you know, some piece of bit here looks dead. Mm. And, and it does made, this with old school graphics. Yeah, all with old school graphics. It's violent good concept, storytelling. If not yeah. in, in like blood and gore. It's fantastic storytelling, dude. It is so good. Hmm. I was I was literally like you know how you get the chills in your spine when you watch a movie you really like and you get all those feels. Yes, that that was I felt that way at the end of this game. Really? Yeah, it was like that. It was a really profound experience. Uh, the guy that created this game is he kind of known for creating similarly themed games, or is he known in the in the gaming world? I think it was his first one. He's super young. Uh, I don't know a lot about him, but uh, he's created a sequel to it. Sort of. It's in like the same universe that came out this year that I haven't checked out yet. But um, yeah, I think he's brand new to this whole thing. But yeah, it's it's really brilliant. Do we need to check his backyard for any hidden secrets? Yeah, he, he might be a serial killer. I think he's like a really weird dude. That's what oh, I is he really? So it makes perfect sense. Yeah. God, man, that's fucking awesome. See, I, I, love, I love that you do that and that you just kind of like take this time to 
devote yourself to a, a fun kind of simple non-academic project. I tend to do that, but usually it's like, I don't know, I drink a lot and dance a lot or something. <laughs> yeah, going to the club is your version. This, this is my I, going to the club. <laughs> I kill I kill all the brain cells that I created <laughs> and all the neural pathways, I destroy them. No, um, I love that. I love playing video games, man. I That's one of the things. Here's my problem. It's one of the things that I intentionally cut myself off from because I know that it is an addiction. Yeah. You know? Like, you have willpower, I think, that I don't have when it comes to that sort of shit. <laughs> like, you're like, yeah, during, you know, time when I've got to mark papers and I'm preparing for classes and I'm teaching and I'm researching and shit like that, I'm not going to do this. For Whereas for me, I'm like, I want to play every day. And I'm like, oh, I'll only play for a couple hours. And then it's five in the morning and my eyes are bloodshot and I've got like a pizza box because I didn't want to leave. So I ordered pizza <laughs> and a fucking soda. And then I'm angry with myself because then I'm eating pizza and soda for days on end and then I'm not sleeping and I'm not showering. And that's, that's how I am with gaming. So for me, I'm like, I just don't play them anymore really, you know? Yeah. It's, it's definitely a, a personal a call you have to make about the, the kinds of uh, vices you can allow yourself and the kinds that you can't. Everyone has yeah. that, that, that dividing line. Yeah. And that's mine because I went through a phase from like, fuck, 19 to 21 where I just smoked weed and played Halo and Madden (laughs) and various other games and like Xbox Live all the time. That's the thing, dude. Okay, quick little rant. Those games like Halo and the multiplayer online games and stuff, they never end. So of course you're going to do it until like your body falls apart. (laughs) You got to like turn off the internet. And play games that have a distinct ending. And then you're like, oh, I'm satisfied. It's done. I can go six uh, months without playing another game again. Yeah, the sports games don't have an end either. Yeah. Because exactly. you can always play another season. You can create another player. You can play with another team. There's another mode. There's another version by the time you finish all those things that comes out. And it's got new features on it. You'd almost think that the people who are game designers know what they're doing. It's almost <laughs> like they took like the tobacco industry and were like, hey, we should copy that model. <laughs> almost, huh? <laughs> uh, well, awesome. I mean, the game sounds fucking rad. I, I'm excited. Like, I want to play the game now. I want to go on holiday and stay with like a friend, <laughs> and there's a TV and a console and one game, and it's Undertale, and I want to play it. Like, that's what I want. And then have it just be like a weekend thing. Yeah, that would be super fun. That's exactly what it was for me. It was like three days. It was awesome. Yeah. Okay, that's what I want to do. All right. Next break. That's what I'm doing. I'm gonna <laughs> find I'm gonna find an Airbnb that happens to have a PS4 and a version <laughs> of Undertale. That's the only criteria. I don't care anything else. <laughs> the Airbnb would be my house? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm coming. Uh all right, guys, thank you so much for tuning in. Um, we'll go ahead and wrap it up here to this long ass episode. We got one more episode of the Cohen book. We'll probably do that in a couple of weeks. Um, so stick around for that. Uh, if you want to go ahead and follow us on Twitter, owls underscore at underscore dawn. You can hit us up on Facebook. Just search for owls at dawn on Facebook so you can keep abreast of what's going on with episodes when they get released and whatnot. Uh, we're on Spotify. So if you're not listening to this on Spotify and you know, you're still streaming or downloading off of our website or through some other kind of convoluted process and you'd rather kind of just do that, you can go to Spotify now. Uh, you can email us owls at dawn gmail. I'm sorry. Owls at dawn podcast at gmail.com. I did it again, Troy. (laughs) And what am I forgetting? I think that's pretty much it. Right, brother? Yeah. And just don't forget that if you give us a five star rating on iTunes and write a review and you write a question in your review, we will answer it on the air. Sick. Sweet, sweet, sweet. Anything else we got to say? Just one more thing, dude. What is that? Das Padania, Americano, speaking.